Hello, Psychology and Motivation. Welcome to Lecture 7, Social Needs. And uh, we're going to look at kind of what might be considered higher level needs. These are acquired needs, so, so we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, here we have very fond memories. We got our, our cat Pigpen, who's uh, departed. He had some uh, kidney issues and actually required an IV infusion on a daily basis for like a year and a half, two years. I never thought I could stick anything with a needle, and I would put the IV needle into Pigpen's back there and give him subcutaneous fluids uh, uh, every day. 100 mils of fluids. And this was his dog, Digby, and, and Digby passed away as well. So. Still miss these guys, but let's talk about uh, our agenda here. I want to start off. We're going to weave an assignment through this, as we are wont to do, uh, with our online format. So let's consider fantasies. A uh, great place to start, right? D have you ever imagined yourself, let's say, maybe in a different car? Like, oh my God, I would look so cool in that car. That'd be so fun to drive that car. Or, or maybe you've imagined yourself saying just the right thing at the right time to really entertain those around you. Uh, or maybe just using the right line and, and making good with it, if, if you will. Uh, for me, deliver a lecture that will have profound impact. And I know, yeah, that's a real fantasy, so let's not go spend too much time on that one. Uh, creating some amazing invention. Right and, and like being you know uh, respected and on Wikipedia for for in inventing this. How about solving a world problem? There you go. There there's a wonderful fantasy. I'm going to solve the problems of the world. Right. Uh, what needs were you fantasizing? Right. This the satiation of. So. It's one thing to have fantasies, and fantasies probably can represent needs, but, but what needs? And, and this is where we go to homework for part one, right? So what I want then uh, from you guys, it's a group level assignment, right? What's the fantasy? What's the potential need fulfilled? And the type of need quasi or social? So we'll have to go on a little bit before those terms maybe make some sense. So let us do so. Uh, and, and you'll see this is part one of homework four, of which I believe there's four parts on this one. Okay, so acquired needs. What are acquired needs? The quasi needs. These are, these are ephemeral. They're situationally dependent wants that create t uh, tense energy to engage in in, in the behavior uh, capable of reducing the built-up tension. So these are things we want, but it's it's we're not talking about drive states. We're not talking about hunger. We're not talking about thirst. We're we're bumping it up a level into this level of social needs. So examples, needing money at the store, right? Well, maybe you're buying food, and so you have a drive, a hunger drive, but what you really need to buy the food then is socially created, that is, you exchange money. So money at the store or, or a Band-Aid after a cut, right? Uh, an umbrella in the rain. These are these are needs that we acquire through our, our learning, our socialization. Uh, so much different types of needs, if you will, than we've talked about previously in this in this class. So we can call these quasi needs because they don't represent. Uh, they represent a need, uh, a learned need state, right? Acquired. These are needs that we acquire through the process of our development. So. Now, acquired needs, social needs, these are, are psychological processes that grow out of socialization history, right, that activates emotional responses to a particular need-relevant incentive. So examples here might be an achievement need, that is to do something of, of some given level, right, an affiliation need, that is to spend time with others, intimacy, that is to share intimately with another person. and, and most of the time when I say intimacy, I'm not talking sexual intimacy. I'm actually talking psychological intimacy, emotional intimacy. And then a power need would be another need that would be uh, a potentially acquired need. But notice these needs are fulfilled out of our social interactions. So you can go back on homework four, take a look at the fantasy, and, and then determine that fantasy would fulfill what need, and, and then I'll classify the need according to what we just discussed. All right? So. Pretty straightforward on that first part.
Potential early social needs sources, well, achievement. Maybe we have parents with high standards, and they imbue in us then this achievement orientation. They've had high standards, so habitually we think in terms of achieving, and, and this then becomes an acquired need. It's not a, a legacy of birth. It's, it's not a genetic legacy. It's something through our process of socialization. And when we were talking previously about more universal needs, notice that the needs we're going to discuss here can be more individualized and vary in their intensity based on our individual experiences. Now, affiliation need. Parents with, uh, that use praise as a socialization technique, right, might in fact then increase our desire to affiliate. Power. Parents that were permissive about sex and aggression. Now, uh, these are pretty damn weak explanations, and we, and we can do better than this, and we're going to explore it through this lecture and, and get more useful uh, sources for these needs. And, and you know that psychology is a moving target, that as we learn more, we develop our theories to a greater extent, we test hypotheses that emerge from those theories, and we add to our wisdom. So psychological knowledge is a moving target and hopefully is ever increasing. So primary need activating incentive, the, the incentive that activates each social needs emotional and behavioral potential. So let's take a look at some examples. The social need is achievement, doing something to show personal competence. Notice that competence was in fact a need that we described earlier right, in the previous lecture, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, and you can see the relationship. So an achievement need is a way to fulfill the competence motive, if you will. Affiliation, opportunity to please others and perhaps gain their approval. And you can see how we might have been socialized to cause this to have different levels of impact importance on us as individuals. Intimacy. We may then value a warm, secure relationship, or perhaps not. Perhaps this has been taken off the table, right? Uh, we see some elderly people who are basically alone, and this need then diminishes in its potency to cause them to behave in a way to satisfy it. Power is simply having impact on others, right? So let's look at achievement then. Need for achievement, desire to do well relative to a standard of excellence. So that is, there's some standard, and, and for our achievement need, we say, oh, I want to get an A on this test, which means I'm likely going to have to score 93% or above, right? So that would be a standard of excellence. Uh, any, any change to a person's sense of competence that, that ends with the objective of becoming successful versus failing, win versus lose, right versus wrong. So these are all kind of surrogates measures of the standard of excellence. High need achievers versus low need achievers, and this is where we begin to see the individuality, the individual differences. Uh, some of us are certainly high need achievers. Others have a really low need for achievement. It's not necessarily on our radar. So this yields approach versus avoidance emotion versus avoidance or I mean approach oriented emotions versus avoidance oriented emotions. If I'm a high need achiever, then I need to approach opportunities to achieve. I need to approach opportunities to demonstrate success, to, to demonstrate competence. But if I'm a low need achiever, I might adopt a different strategy to satisfy my minimal achievement need, and that is just simply to avoid failure. And notice, approaching success and avoiding failure are two very different things, but they're implied by the level of our achievement need, individually oriented. So, differences in choice, latency, how long we wait before we begin a task, effort, persistence, how long we work on the task, willing to take personal responsibility for success and failure are all tied to this and are all observable based on our, uh, our need to achieve. Can you hang on a second? I hear growling. I hear fussing down here. Quincy, go away. Terrence, leave him alone. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know why they do that. It makes no sense. They're going to sit there in this little space and they're going to growl at each other to no end. I mean, I, I, I don't know what it means, but it's something that they do. So, Origins of the need for achievement then? Well, the parents... In <laughs>
<laughs> independence training, high performance aspirations, realistic standards of excellence, you know, positing va positive value of achievement related pursuits, right? And, and we know that we differ in this. Uh, I could bring home, uh, you know, from the time I was in grade school, I might bring home a report card, and if I got a B, my mom's approach to a B was, how come this isn't an A? It's not like, good job, you got a B. It's not <laughs> my mom was always like, how come this isn't an A? You're capable of doing an A. You need to get an A, right? So it's setting up that achievement motive, right? Especially tying it to approval, right? Which can cause then this habitual approach towards achieving uh, and, and, and kind of an approach motivation to approach opportunities to earn that A to in fact gain approval, right? Now the cognitive influences, perception of high ability, okay, I can do this and I should be doing better. Mastery orientation, I want to learn this, I want to get this under my belt. High expectations for success, we also know that term by another name, self-efficacy, the belief that we can do it. Strong valuing of achievement. And note that that is something that our parents quite often pass on to us. And note that parents are quite often the source of many of these. Optimistic attribution style, that is, I believe I can do this, right? So now the developmental influences then, achievement related beliefs, values, emotions, all show predictable developmental patterns. So it's this constellation of influences as we're growing up, right, that begin to yield kind of our need profiles in this regard. And hence, we call these social needs, right? We call these quasi-needs because they were acquired over time. They were acquired as part of the developmental process. Now, achievement motivation, there's two theoretical approaches to explaining achievement motivation. And that is the classical approach, which we're going to look at first, given to us by Atkinson, and then the traditional achievement goals. Now, if you've been in some of my other classes, you might have observed that I have a fondness for formulas, and that is models that explain theoretical relationships. So let's look at Atkinson's model, and yeah, let's look at it because this is homework for part two, right? So we'll see how it goes. First time we've ever tried this, uh, maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, maybe you'd be somewhere in between. So the tendency to achieve, we're looking at a person, what is their tendency to achieve? What does that mean? What is the tendency to achieve? Well, it is a combination of the tendency to approach success and the tendency to avoid failure. So if we're looking and we want to, let's say, predict our own or somebody else's tendency to achieve, what's the likelihood that they will achieve? Then we break it down into multiple components components and we kind of do the math and that's what this assignment's going to be about this portion of the assignment so the tendency to approach success right is first of all the ms is the motive to approach success how important is it for me how motivated am i to succeed right and we know that as individuals we vary in that level of motivation right but the motivation to succeed is one thing. What is my perceived probability of success? Do I believe that I can succeed? And that really kind of ties into the self-efficacy. And then we have to also consider what is the incentive value of the success? I mean, is it a meaningful success? Or is it kind of a success that I don't give a shit about? It has low incentive value. I might succeed, but I don't really care. You know, if you give me a coloring book and you say, hey, can you successfully stay in the lines? And I'm like, yeah, probably. And I don't really care if I do or not. I mean, but if you're asking, hey, there's a final exam coming. How do you feel about how you want to do on this exam? And I say, well, if I, if I pass this exam, if I do well in this exam, I'll get an A in the course. And it probably then puts me in line for a scholarship. Then the incentive value of success has increased dramatically, right? So the tendency to approach success then can be calculated. What is a person's motive to approach success? What is their perceived probability? And what is the incentive value? Right? And, and this becomes a very interesting concept, a similar concept in organizational psychology when we're looking at employees uh, who are given tasks, right? Now, the other flip side of this, though, the, the flip side is the tendency to avoid failure. So what is my motivation to my motive to avoid failure? 
Now, a lot of us don't even really kind of think in terms of avoiding failure because we're so busy focusing approaching success that we're not looking at avoiding failure. It's not even really on our radar necessarily. Whereas other students might say, oh God, just please don't let me fail this test. If I get a C, I'll be happy, right? So notice that's a lot different than someone who says, I want the highest score in the class on this test. One is clearly the motivation to succeed. One is clearly the motivation to avoid failing. So the motive to avoid failure, let's say, could be accessed numerically. The perceived probability of failure is what's my, what's the, the opposite of my likelihood to succeed is the probability of my failure. So notice this is a simple, when we look at, at PF, the perceived probability of failure, it's one minus the perceived probability of success because probability's always got to add up to one, right? So this, this one we can calculate. And then the negative incentive value for failure. So the incentive value of success is like, oh my God, there's a powerful incentive for succeeding. The flip side of that is the incentive for failing or to avoid the, uh, the incentive value for failure. Question then, that being said, and if you didn't get it yet, that's fine because we're gonna work through it, right? And, and that's why we have this homework uh, for part two, can we numerically assess a tendency to achieve in a given domain? And let's keep it domain specific because my motivation to achieve, let's say making a free throw on the basketball court is way different than my motive for producing a good lecture. Right, so we can see that domain matters. Some things, some domains, our our performance is unimportant. We've already talked about this. Other domains, our performance becomes extremely important, and that ties to self-concept among other things. So, select a domain of achievement. For example, passing a test. Maybe it's repairing a carburetor. Right, setting a personal best for running a mile. I was toying with a carburetor. I had a '73 Ford F250 when I lived in Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, and I wanted to sell it, and it was not running as well as it could. I, you know, put a rebuilt carburetor on it, and I was messing with it, and I wasn't getting it quite right, but then when I decided to sell it, it's like, I really have to get out there and work on that carburetor so that it makes the vehicle more attractive and I can get the price I want. So notice that, in fact, my incentive uh, became quite severe or, or quite intense in that regard. Uh, sorry, I'm doing something in the background here, so I had a message box come up and I have to click it. So, that being said, then I got I got to get this out of the way, or I can't see what I'm doing. So maybe this is your best time for running a mile. All right? Uh, someone saying yes to a request for a date. Uh, that's you know, if we ask someone out on a date, we're we're hoping that we succeed in in that request. All right? Uh, we're just having all kinds of fun here. And the domain of achievement, right? So now you're going to list the domain of achievement as part of the assignment. B, part B, now we need to formulate questions to assess MS, PS, IS, and MAF. We do not need questions for PF or IF because remember those were calculated values. PF is 1 minus PS, so we don't need a question for it. And uh, right, IF is 1 minus IS. They're calculated variables. We'll get to that. Fear not. I'm hoping that this will be clear. Notice, I'm hoping to successfully create an assignment and explain it clearly. Uh, I'm motivated for success in this regard. Right. All right. So hopefully this is now done. There we go. Now, let's suppose we selected fixing the carburetor as our achievement domain. Here's a question we could ask to ascertain, right, how important is it to fix this carburetor? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, right? So, and notice that we use a scale, and I, I'm going to want you to design the question and the accompanying scale for this assignment. Now, I will say this the scale that I'm presenting here is not at all important and totally important, and I'm a stickler for scale labels. Each spot should have a label, but an exception is often if we're using going from nothing to totally. 
a 1 to 10 scale is a scale that people use naturally. We rank shit from 1 to 10 all the time. So we can probably get away with using the scale with only the anchors and not the individual scale items. So question number one, how important is it? Right? And you're going to write your own questions according to whatever domain you're operating in. Now, please design questions to assess level of PS, IS, and MAF. You're going to need to write four questions in all. So you've got the first question, now you write the other three. Please use the scale above. Note you will need to change the scale labels on some question from important to something like probability or desirable. Right? So how important it is it is one question, but then how desirable is it gets to the incentive value, correct? And how probable, right, high probability, low probability gets to the probability issue. We need to get a number for each of these. So what I want to see in the assignment is question and scale for motivation to succeed. I got a high motivation to, to fix that carburetor, right? What is the probability that I will successfully do it, right? What is the incentive value of doing it well? And then, what is my desire to avoid failure in this? So, develop the scales. That's part B, the question and the scales. And now, answer the questions. And that is, run it out. So this is something you're, you're doing in a team. You guys can settle on one area. You can work with each other. Here's what you do with the data, though, because remember, Atkinson developed an equation. So here you go. And what do we have? Okay, so we have the motivation to succeed, the probability of success, and the incentive value. We also have the motivation to avoid failure. What I've done in the assignment is I've embedded an Excel sheet in the assignment, a little Excel box, and it should make these calculations for you automatically. So once you enter values, then it should start calculating. As soon as you enter right, uh, certain values, then it will calculate the other values on your behalf. Questions about that? And then, what do we end up with? Well, the TS, which was that if T, the TS, the tendency to succeed, the tendency to avoid failure, right? These numbers then are generated as calculations from here, and it should calculate it automatically for you. If it doesn't, let me know, and, and I'll figure out what I did wrong. And then the overall tendency to achieve. Answer the questions at this point is, if TA is positive, what does that mean? And uh, if TA is, is negative, then what does that mean? Okay. Questions about that? Work through it. If you work through it, it'll probably, you'll probably be able to answer your own questions as you go through it. So I thought it would be fun. I like to take these models, right, because basically what we're doing now is Atkinson's gave us a model, and we're just making it real. We're asking a question that allows us to determine a numerical value, 1 through 10, right, on the motivation to approach. We're writing another question with another 1 to 10 scale to develop a number that we can place on TS, a number we can place on IS, and a number we can place on MAF. Four questions, four scales give us these values. These values plug in, we do the math, this is simply multiplying those three values, multiplying these three values, notice that those two values we don't need to ask questions because they're derived mathematically, right, and this gives us the tendency to achieve. And then I ask you the question, if TA is negative, what does it mean? If TA is positive, what does it mean? All right. So what we're doing is taking a theoretical model and developing a questionnaire that then fills out the theoretical model for us and allows us perhaps to be able to predict someone's behavior. I know. Crazy, huh? So let's try it out. We'll see how it works. So what do you think? Was that complicated enough? Let's uh, take a look at something that's maybe a tad simpler, uh, kind of just more of an overview, if you will, of the process. The dynamic of action model, what we're looking at here is explaining the stream of ongoing observable behavior. 
and, and the explanations for what we observe come from the approach tendencies in, in the subject and the inhibition tendencies. So imagine uh, that the behavior is affected by the strength of this approach versus the strength of the avoidance. And, and what does that mean? Well, like latency. Latency is how soon do we begin the task knowing that we need to do the task. Uh, some people might call this procrastination. But if I have a high approach tendency for this particular task, then you're likely to see me begin it sooner that is with uh, you know less latency than if I have a high inhibition tendency. So things I really want to do that I want to succeed at, I will get on relatively quickly. Right? Notice persistence can be explained in the same way. If I really have a motivation to approach this task, then that can affect my persistence in a positive manner. And then switching. Non-achievement task occurs with rising consumption. So the switching can be explained as consummation increases. And what does consummation mean? Completing the task, right? So if I really want to do well on a test, you will see me engage in studying behavior very early and persist at that studying behavior. If I'm worried about failing a test, right, quite often then I might procrastinate studying. I, I put it out of my mind. I don't want to because I just want to avoid failing. I don't really care how well I do as long as I don't fail. But once I take the test, right, the test is over, the consumatory behavior is completed, then there is no more influence of TS or TAF on that particular task, on that particular test. Right. So conditions that involve and satisfy the need for achievement, well, if I have a high achievement motive, and I know many of you have a high achievement motive, one way to demonstrate it is participating in moderately difficult tasks. Let's face it, if we achieve on an easy task, there's not a lot that we can take away from it. Well, that was easy. The sense of achievement isn't really satisfied, so we need a moderately difficult task. Competition can be a component of this as well. Now, I'm not a big fan of competition. Uh, I believe there's a huge number of myths surrounding the benefits of competition between people. But competing with oneself, that is self-improvement, I think, is very much a source of achievement. Doing better than I did last time. And especially for those who, uh, those of us who engage in any kind of physical activity or, or, you know, like running, man, I ran that mile faster than I've ever run it before, or bench pressing, I bench press more weight this time than I've ever done before. That kind of self-competition uh, can be a source of tremendous achievement. Right? And then entrepreneurship. And this is taking hold, behaving autonomously, autonomously, I'm sorry, and, and creating something as a result of it. So moderately difficult tasks are preferred by those with high achievement needs. It allows us for experiencing emotions such as pride and satisfaction, if those are emotions at all. And those of you who are also taking psych of emotion, you know how I feel about emotions. One of the things I'll always ask is, is that an emotion? All right, so is pride an emotion? Well, perhaps, is satisfaction and emotion, perhaps, but then we can probably create an argument that no, it isn't. But for the purposes of this class, let's, let's just go with calling them emotions. It allows for meaningful testing of one's skills, and that is the demonstration of competency. If it's easy, then I really haven't demonstrated I was competent. You know, if you said, hey, Mark, can you, can you dial the phone? And I'm like, yeah, I've been doing that all my life. There's no sense of achievement or accomplishment in that. So moderately difficult tasks. Now, this brings us to the notion of social facilitation. And social facilitation really, in, in, in one way, looks at task difficulty as a critical element. So... Social facilitation, how does it work? Well, we've got a little systems model here that we'll run through. First of all, for social facilitation, according to Dr. Zients, the, the creator of this uh, theory, we need the presence of conspecifics. That is, we need those of our own species, that's what conspecific means, members of your own species around. So they have to be present, okay? according to Zients. And 
the presence of others of our own species has a minimal effect it at least increases our arousal to some degree now what this means is are there people around and are people watching me okay now if they're watching me this increases my arousal that is because I'm kind of performing at this point since they are my audience if you will he says that this strengthens dominant response now what this means is a dominant response is something that you've learned to do that is almost habitual if you will note that if you've done something over and over and over again it becomes easier so we can any time in this model we see easy we could also say well practiced right when we're saying hard we could say unpracticed and that's what makes it difficult right but what we see is if the task is easy that is we will see a performance enhancement so what science is saying the presence of others increases my arousal but if it's doing something that I'm well rehearsed at doing then we're actually going to see me do it better but if for example this is the first time I've ever done it right we're going to see my performance diminished as a result of the presence of this conspecifics so this increased arousal if it's something we're well rehearsed actually increases our performance but if it's something we have not practiced then we often see a performance impairment one of the difficulties for us lecturers who are videotaping our lectures is we lack the presence of conspecifics so we don't get that arousal so it's difficult to do this I would much rather lecture in a classroom than to a camera right I, I think I put out a better product face to face because your energy right your participation that serves to increase my arousal and I think makes me more effective right when I'm rehearsed right now if I'm unrehearsed then it could in fact inhibit my performance to a certain degree so another way to think about this is let's suppose you've got a new job and the boss says hey here's what you need to do go ahead and start doing that and it's the first time you've ever done it would you prefer the boss to be breathing down your neck or would you prefer them to go away and let you practice it for a while before they come back and watch you most of the time we want to be able to do it on our own so we don't have this presence right that this breathing down our neck that interferes with our ability to explore and practice the task now why does social facilitation occur well science offered us the mere presence theory that is the presence of the conspecific is enough to trigger the arousal okay and, and science was the first out of the gate with this idea there were modifications made to the social facilitation theory beyond science over time All right so oh wait what is that well it's supposed to be a cockroach at least a human headed cockroach and, and why am I showing you a cockroach when I'm talking about science's social facilitation well remember science used the term conspecific that is members of one's own species so his original work his empirical demonstration of, of his theory of mere presence was actually done with cockroaches running mazes and the mazes were made out of clear plastic clear plexiglass and what he could do then is he could create mazes that were difficult or mazes that were easy and remember that could be mazes that the cockroach had performed before so they were well rehearsed or uh, mazes that they hadn't done before so those would be hard right and might demonstrate a, a performance decrement right and then what does he do well he has a little box a clear plastic box of cockroaches that he can put next to the maze so he can manipulate the presence of an audience or not right and, and what he then demonstrated was when there was other cockroaches present a well rehearsed maze the cockroach performed better on the maze an unrehearsed maze the cockroach did not perform as well I know cockroaches so there you go and hence the term conspecific rather than simply people what science is saying this is kind of happens across species now evaluation apprehension theory comes along and, and Cottrell then expands the notion he says you know what yeah I understand the social facilitation but I disagree with science on one key point that is it's not the presence of others the mere presence like science is saying 
It's the presence of others who are in a position to be able to evaluate. So if others are able to evaluate, then it triggers the social facilitation mechanism. But if they're not capable of evaluating, it's just as if they're not there, right? And, and they don't really matter. So he added in that ability to evaluate, which I think was key. Now, how did Cottrell do this in the lab? Well, he had people come in the laboratory, right? And the participant has to perform an act. They can be assigned to one of three conditions. That is, they may perform the act alone, or they may perform the act with others watching them. But the third condition becomes problematic because how do you have people present who are not able to evaluate? And what Cottrell did is blindfolded the audience. So people were present, but since they were blindfolded, they were unable to evaluate the visual performance, right? So uh, he kind of debunked science. They're merely present, but if they're not in a position to evaluate, it doesn't have the impact. It doesn't have the effect. And this is the beauty of social psychological science. It always builds on itself. So we always explore ideas in terms of what someone did before and how we might extend it into the future. Fascinating. Now, what does this have to do with stereotype threat? And you might have learned about stereotype threat in Psych 1100 or in social psych, especially if you took the second level writing class. Stereotype threat is basically the idea that if you believe you're representing your category membership on a task and people will evaluate you, that this extra burden of performing and having it affect people's perception of your group then may in fact cause you to have a diminished performance. Now, evaluation apprehension theory, this is the third, well, technically the second extension of, of social facilitation. We have the presence of others, and that's key. And if they're not able to evaluate, Cottrell already described that to us, right? But if they are able to evaluate, then what we see is the arousal, and that then cascades the social facilitation effect. Now, let's take a look at expectations, stereotypes, and IQ scores. Scores are affected by expectations for performance, and these expectations are shaped by cultural stereotypes. So if you belong to a cultural group that is stereotyped as performing poorly in a given area, right? The problem is when you perform, your performance reflects on the people of your group. So you don't get to go in and do an individual performance let's say if you're a stereotype minority. You are performing on behalf of all your group members. And this places an extra burden on you which can distract one from performing well. So stereotype threat then is this burden of doubt one feels about his performance due to negative stereotypes about his group's ability. And research has shown that the the effects occur on African Americans, Latinos, low-income people, women, and elderly people. Uh, just having your group membership evoked can interfere with your ability to perform because your performance is no longer about you. It's about you and your people, so to speak. So, how did Steele and Aronson demonstrate this? Steele had students at Stanford, this is, he's at Stanford, right? take a verbal test to determine whether the fear of confirming a negative stereotype was at the, at the heart of stereotype threat. Now, the test was either explained as being diagnostic, that is, this test is a good indication of your ability, or for people in the other condition, they were told that the test is experimental and we really just need people to take the test so we can evaluate the test. Notice they shifted the emphasis of evaluation not on the person taking the test, but the test itself. Right? Now the DV, the dependent variable, was the performance on the task. Well, when the verbal task was couched in terms of being diagnostic, white students outperformed black students in this sample. When the verbal task was described as not diagnostic, white, black, white differences disappeared. And I think the graph really spells it out here. Those people assigned to the diagnostic condition, this test demonstrates your abilities. Notice the African Americans, their performance suffers because if African Americans are stereotyped as not doing well on this type of test, then these poor folks in the diagnostic condition are, let's use the term, representing.
So they don't get to just be themselves. They have to represent their group. And that distraction causes their performance to diminish. The same test given to people who, when it's told it's not diagnostic, notice the performance differences disappear. So what we're looking at here is the difference is that heightened arousal causes a distraction that diminishes performance. Wow. So whether people are motivated to do well or not, note that these people not only are motivated to do well, but they have a second motivation to represent their group well. And that then, in fact, diminishes their performance. So further stereotype, well, it gets insidious here. Blacks taking a test were asked to check a race box before or after the test. So now what we have is a test. People just come in and take the test. And the only manipulation in this experiment is a box that has you indicate your race before you take the test or no box. And what happens is African-American students who have to check the box indicating their race then have their race activated in their mind which causes them to have at least this non-conscious concern about representing their group on this test. One thing that we can learn from this is there's absolutely no reason for anyone when they take a test, be it the SAT, the GRE, the LSAT, whatever, to fill out the demographic information before they take the test. We can put the demographic information at the end of the test where it has no influence on people's perception of themselves. It doesn't activate any potential stereotypes. Now one of my favorite experiments to demonstrate the effects of stereotype threat, and just because it's absolute cleverness, was they used Asian women were asked to take a math test and they were randomly assigned to different conditions where they checked the box for the test, right? That indicated, so some Asian women are given a test where they have to indicate race. Other Asian women are given a, the same test, but they don't indicate race before they take it, they indicate gender. What do you think the results were on the performance on this math test? Yep, you'd be right. That is Asian women who got to check the Asian box performed well on the math test. Asian women who performed, I mean, Asian women who checked the gender box performed poorly, right? And the control condition of no checking boxes landed right in the middle. So note, think about the stereotypes for Asians. They kick ass in math, they kick ass in science. So if I get to check that Asian box, I'm like, here I go, man. I'm in the top-notch group performing this. But we know that the stereotype for women in mathematics is don't worry your pretty little head about the checkbook, ladies. Let the man balance it for you, right? Negative stereotypes for math performance against women. So the Asian women who had to check the gender box had gender activated, different stereotype activated, whereas Asian women who got to check the race box, the ethnicity box, they had Asian activated, different stereotype affected their performance. Is that messed up or what? Fascinating area. Right? As an aside, when I, uh, I'm a white male, so I never have to represent anyone. Think about it. What are the stereotypes for white males in the United States? I mean, maybe over the last five years, six years, they've deteriorated significantly. But prior to that, a white male is a cultural default. I never had to represent anyone my whole life. My performance has always been Mark's performance. If I do poorly on a math test, do people walk around and say, well, see, that just confirms the stereotype about white men. What stereotype about white men? Right? It doesn't exist. So white men got a free ride on this. There's little stereotype threat present. But I did experience stereotype threat once. And that's when I went to a train the trainer session. When I was working at the paper mill, my boss asked, hey, would you like to go to this train the trainer session to learn how to do a total quality training and see what it's all about? And I, and I said, well, I don't know. And they says, four days at the coast, do you want to go? And I'm like, four days at the Oregon coast to sit here, sit there and learn how to do a training. You mean I'd have to leave all my packaging machines uh, working at midnight and I could just go live a normal life for a week at a resort on the coast in Oregon? I think I'll go. And I went. Well, I got there, and it was pretty weird.
because when I got there, it was all managers and vice presidents. And I was the only union worker. I'm this lowly little packaging machine operator. And I believe that I experienced some tremendous stereotype threat. Because with these 20 people I'm with, who are all management and above, right? And here I am, this lowly hourly union worker. I felt like everything I did was under a microscope. And everything I did, especially if I didn't do it well, they would say, oh, see those union guys? And it was the first time in my life I actually ever had to, I felt that I had to represent. I was not a free agent, so to speak. Uh, so stereotype threat could have been a real possibility there. Questions? Fascinating area of research. Let's talk a little bit about competition. For high achievers, competition generates typically positive emotions, right, and approach motivation, that they like to engage in competitions. They look forward to competition because how else do you demonstrate your skill and your competence, right? for athletes especially. So, and you'll generally see improved performance if you buy into the social facilitation theory, right? Now, I have problems with between team and between people competition. I, I think we've been sold a lot of myths and uh, once I retire, the first book I'm going to write is called The Competition Myth. I don't believe there's any empirical support. I don't believe there's ever been a study that shows that competition and cooperation as the manipulated variable that competition produces a superior outcome to cooperation. That's my basic premise, but we don't need to spend too much time there. One thing I do know, though, about competition is I don't have to do my best to win. I just have to do better than the person with whom I'm competing. And note that a lot of times when the Buckeyes, when Buckeye football kicks ass on a mediocre team, the satisfaction level I mean, we beat them, but we didn't even have to turn in our best game. We didn't even have to bring 70% of our game to beat them. We could have beat them with 50% of our game. So the rewards in that achievement area, right, not as high as if we're playing an excellent team and we barely beat them, but we do beat them. We go, woo, we brought our best game and we kicked their ass, right? So... For low achievers, what does competition mean? Usually negative emotion. They approach competition. Uh, they tend to avoid competition. But if they do decide they need to compete, it's usually anxiety generating. So they have the, the avoidance motivation. They'll do anything they can avoid do to avoid the competition. And if they're thrust into a competition, we often see inhibited performance as a result of this. That goes back to the dynamics of action model that we discussed as well. Remember, the motivation to succeed compared to the motivation to avoid failure. So, when am I a fan of competition? Well, when we're competing against ourselves, when we're trying to better ourselves. So, don't, you know, don't, please don't assume that I'm against competition. I'm all about self-improvement. And to me, that's the most valuable form of competition there is, is turning in an increasingly better performance as measured against one's previous performance. And note, there's no cheating that. Either, either you did or you didn't. Let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. High achievers more likely to assume entrepreneurship activities. That is to put it out there, to put themselves out on a limb, to try something that's creative. McClellan found high ACH students, and that's the abbreviation you got it for high achievement students, more likely to be in entrepreneur positions 14 years later in his longitudinal study. Right Now, high achievers seem to be less risk averse. They're more willing to take risks. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be creative, you have to take risks. You're not going to be an entrepreneur you're not going to be considered creative if you simply do something that someone else did before. You have to do something new, and there's risk involved in that. It, now, the, the benefits is it supplies immediate concrete feedback. That is, when I'm trying to create something, and finally, it's that aha moment when I get it, that's it. Notice the impact of that immediate concrete feedback. I did it. I succeeded, right? And high achievement people crave that sensation and they will continue to put themselves in situations even though there's a risk of failure 
Because let's face it, if you want to be creative, you're going to fail more than you're going to succeed. But the high achiever is willing to endure those failures for that sweet smell of success, if you'll allow that cliche. So, from classic to contemporary, classical achievement behavior is a choice. Will the person approach or avoid? Contemporary, contemporary views now shift to the why from whether. So, and those of you are, are methodologists, you say, well, that sounds like moderation versus mediation. When we use moderating variables in psychological studies, we're asking, is there a difference between men and women? That's the moderator, right? Is there a difference between high achievers and low achievers? That's the moderator. The big question, the gold standard question for psychological studies in the 21st century is not who, but why and how. So we involve ourselves in looking for the mechanism rather than the who's. Okay? So let's talk about achievement goals, two main achievement goals. Then we can slice and dice achievement into these two areas, these two levels. One is the mastery goal. The other is the performance goal. Now with mastery, I'm interested in developing my competence, making progress, self-improvement as I described earlier, overcome difficulties with effort and persistent. That is, I've mastered the task. I own this shit, right? Now, performance goals are to display one's competence, right? Display high ability to outperform others, to succeed with little apparent effort. Now, to turn in a good performance and make it look effortless, I say, look at me, I am awesome. But note that if it's mastery, I expect the performance to be difficult, and I'm going to overcome it anyway. So performance, and we're going to flesh this out to a greater degree. So let's think about it. The benefits of adopting mastery goals, what comes from it? If we have a mastery goal rather than the performance goal, Right? We have preference for challenging tasks that one can learn from. That is, I want to be challenged. I want to master the task. So I'm willing to fail initially to then demonstrate from failure grew into success. It gives me information about my persistence, my stick my gumption, my grit, all those fantastic words that our parents and grandparents used as they're trying to teach us to toughen up, right? Use conceptually based learning strategies. That is learning strategies that I can apply across different domains, right? Not what is the answer, but what is the process I use to come to the answer, right? Experience greater intrinsic than ex extrinsic motivation. Let's face it, it's the satisfaction of doing better on that test than I've done before. That is an intrinsic motivator. The extrinsic motivator is the number, the score on that test. Right? More likely to ask for information and help when I want to master. That is, I'm interested in doing this well. I'm interested in understanding what I'm doing. I don't want you to simply tell me the answer. I want you to help me be able to figure out the answer for myself. That's mastery, right? So what do we see as a result of adoption of mastery goals, shifting our emphasis to mastery rather than performance? We tend to work harder, we tend to persist longer, and we tend to perform better over the long run. So let's look at the downside to performance goals. Well, performance goals, you have to beat someone else. Now, I don't know about you, but this is one thing that really bothers me about <laughs> competition, is I don't like making other people feel bad. And if I beat someone, what I'm saying is I'm better than you. And that's likely to make people feel bad. I wouldn't want someone doing that to me. So I don't know why I would want to do that to someone else, right? When I was in community college at Santa Ana, I took a class, it was a philosophy class, I took logic as my philosophy class, and I remember a great guy, Dr. Deaver, he taught part-time at Santa Ana College, he was at Long Beach State, uh, full-time, and, and as many teachers do, they teach at multiple colleges to make a, a decent living. And I remember Dr. Deaver gave us these great tests. 
It was a small class. It could only have been maybe 25 students, which is small to me. But the one thing I didn't like that Deaver did, Dr. Deaver, cool guy, but and it was a short answer tests, right? He believed in essay tests. He, he didn't like multiple choice. So it was all short answers and it's all this logic stuff. And when he would hand back the test, you know, after it had been graded, he would say, okay, so the person with the highest score is going to go up in front of the class and go over the test for everybody. Well, unfortunately, we had three midterms before our final exam, and I had the highest score each time. So each time I had to go up in front of the class and tell the class, essentially tell them the correct answers. And it's like, this is really awkward, and this really sucks. Because I'm sure these people did a great job, but here I am again, you know, and, and they're not. And the fact that they're not, and I am, probably doesn't make them feel too good. And I don't like that. I, I would have just much preferred that Deaver just gave us our test back, right? And we go over the test, we learn from it, and call it good, right? It's not about someone beating or, or turning in the top score, or it was not, it was, it was just uncomfortable for me. Other people might eat that shit up, right? Now, think about it. The downside to performance goals, you have to beat someone else. Cheating can be a successful strategy. That is when it comes to performance, right? I can get the highest score on a test in a class by cheating. Not by mastering the material. So this is another downside to performance goals. Right? A performance doesn't have to be good or represent improvement. It just has to win. That is, you just have to be better than everybody else. So it doesn't have to be your best, and it doesn't even have to be good. It just beat everybody else. So to me, the, you know, the, it tilts, but I'm biased, and I hope I've successfully admitted my bias to you. You might disagree, and that, that'd be A-OK, -okay, right? So if you succeed in cheating someone, don't think the person is a fool. Realize the person trusted you more than you deserved. And, and I hate to say it, I'm on COAM, right? And I hear cases all the time, and it breaks my heart to hear people have cheated. Because why? Now, I, I understand, and, and, and I'll put some of the burden on teachers, because when I see stupid assignments in which students see no purpose or no point, you know, and they're expected to engage in a mastery kind of approach to this, when it's stupid bullshit in the first place, no. Stupid assignments generate usually performance motives. Interesting assignments are more likely to generate mastery motives. So it ain't all on the students. We're not going to blame all the students. It's teachers as much as anything that can shape the environment that promotes mastery and diminishes the desire for performance. Now, obviously, that's not the solution. There are some people who don't like to fly by the straight and narrow. They like to take shortcuts, and they will continue to. But... That's another story, right? Now, achievement goals in the classroom. Let's compare mastery versus performance, the two subheadings of achievement goals, right? Success is defined as, for mastery goals, someone wants to demonstrate improvement, demonstrate progress. I think it's a beautiful thing if we can learn to grade in a way where we're grading on the basis of improvement, not grading necessarily against an objective standard. Because notice, people who come into a classroom with high ability are going to do better. People who come into a classroom with low ability are not going to do as well. But think about it. The person with low ability might show the greatest level of improvement, but it's still not up to the person's level of high ability. And yet, they showed vast amounts of improvement. So, so I believe mastery more important th than performance. Now, performance goal, high grades, high, high normative performance. Now, classroom dimension, value placed on, for someone with a mastery goal, is the effort and the learning. I like to look in terms of effort, and I'm trying to write assignments that tap into effort more than they do correct answers, right? Normatively high ability. Those of us who are blessed with higher IQs perform better in school, typically, all else being equal. But it has nothing to do with 
our effort, our persistence, or anything like that. It was a genetic roll of the dice. Uh, is that something that we should reward? Should we play this cosmic dice game where we roll the dice, mom and dad get busy, that's our genetic material comes out in the dice, should that be the criteria that determines these kinds of rankings? It doesn't seem really fair. But then some people might argue, well, life isn't fair. So, you know, reasons for satisfaction, working hard, the challenge. Performance goal, doing better than others. This is one of the things I, I loved about my dissertation and I loved about my master's thesis. I'm not in competition with anyone. I'm just busting my ass to master this material, write it well and clearly, right? I remember in my master's thesis when Tanya Chartrand, who was on my committee, she said, Mark, I was scared to death of your master's thesis because I know you had studies where you had three or four independent variables and you had three or four, uh, three or four way interactions, but you explained them super clearly and it was no sweat. It was easy to follow. And that made me feel so good, right? It's not about beating someone else. It's like taking a, a, a complicated explanation and explaining it in a way that someone said that was clear. Thank you. That's mastery, right? So teacher oriented toward students are learning, students are performing. I'll tell you what, online, I decided, hey, we got to get rid of the midterms, we got to get rid of the final exam. Too much emphasis on that and opens the door to too much academic misconduct, right? But I'm not going back. When we get into the classroom, I'm going to stick with the homework assignments. I'm going to really diminish the tests because I'm not interested in the performance on a, on a multiple choice test. I'm interested in what we learn that we can take into our community and make the world a better place. Views errors, errors, errors are part of learning. Whereas if you're performance oriented, right, errors are like anxiety. Focus of attention, process of learning, okay, for performance goal, other performance relative, uh, my performance relative others, uh, reasons for effort, learning something new, for performance goal, high grades, performing better than others, right. So, evaluation criteria, and if we could shift to this in an academic, that is be able to measure someone's ability as they move in to do something, and then at the end of the course measure their ability and talk in terms of measuring the level of improvement, right, rather than the level of performance against a standardized goal. I'm down with it, and you know who else the hell is down with it? Salcon. Khan Academy. So, uh, segue out of this, there's a link in Carmen to this video. I'm not going to show the video here. Uh, I do that sometimes, but it's a pretty long video. No, it's not a long video. So, it's, it's an excellent video. So, go ahead and check that out. And, and after you check that out, you can come back to this. Uh, and I'm going to present the homework. So, you want to pause or stop here, wh whatever you want, however you want to handle that. Watch the video. I think it's awesome. Khan makes such an excellent case, and he uses such fantastic examples. Uh, the, the probably the most effective metaphor you can imagine. Uh, what a genius! What an entrepreneur! Saul Khan, the Khan Academy. Okay, so uh, you can pause, whatever. I, I'm going to continue on here, but because you got control of that. But this will lead us then to homework four, part three. This is where we're going to explore and apply achievement goals, performance, and mastery. So what's Saul Khan's argument? Please give an example of a performance goal. What is a pro of the performance goal? And what is the con of that performance goal? And then please give an example of a mastery goal. So between Khan's video right, and what we've just discussed in the previous part of the lecture here, uh, give the example of the mastery goal and what's a pro and a con. Again, let's stick with the pros and cons to me because the real learning comes from the analysis of pros and cons, not a right answer. So, homework four, thought experiment time, part three. What does this newfound knowledge of mastery goals imply for trainers, teachers, and parents? And please answer each. So what I'd like us to do at this point is if we've mastered the ideas that we've discussed up to this point, we should then be able to imply apply them in a context of being a trainer 
and many of you will engage in training. Many of you have already engaged in training in, in various areas, whether it's athletics, whether it's on the job, whether it's academic tutoring, whatever. What does it imply for teachers and what does it imply for parents? So please answer each in this regard. Okay. Now, let's in integrate the classical contemporary approaches to achievement motivation. The classical approach like Atkinson's theory, right, is the approach and then the classical, the contemporary approach is achievement goals, develops an integrated model, and here we go. So enjoy. What well, we have then, antecedents, consequences, antecedents, what comes in front. Antecedents set the stage. I know it's a fancy word, it's a great word, antecedents. This sets the stage. Consequences are what ultimately occur, right? So. To the extent that someone has achievement motivation, we can see that it's a high correlation to mastery goals. If people expect to do well, that is their competence expectancy, then that we see a mastery goal. Fear of failure does not connect to the mastery goal, but it does connect strongly to the performance avoidance goal or the performance approach goal, right? So. But let's go and let's kind of integrate this with where we've been in the course. Notice where intrinsic motivation occurs. It comes out of, right, it's associated strongly with the mastery goal. Whereas the performance and the, the avoidance goals then lead to great performance. So example items then, mastery. Let's look at a mastery statement. I desire to completely master the material presented in this class. That's a mastery goal, right? In a class like this, I prefer course material that really challenges me so I can learn new things. That's a mastery goal, right? Now, let's compare those to achievement goals, performance approach goals. My goal in this class is to get a better grade than most of the students. Strictly performance. Notice you need others to whom you can compare yourself, right? And approach, I want to do well in this class to show my ability to my family, my friends, my advisors. So really what you're interested in, though, is the performance that you can show the score, that you can show the grade. Now, let's look at achievement goal scale performance avoidance goal. And the avoidance goal, I just, I just want to avoid doing poorly in this class, right? My fear of performing poorly in this class is often what motivates me. Avoidance goals... Avoidance goals lead to maladjusted coping strategies and achievement settings, right? So, fear of failure then leads to performance avoidance goals. And the consequence is lowered self-esteem, a sense of lowered personal control, less vitality, less energy, right? A diminished life satisfaction and diminished psychological well-being. So part of this course is developing the story of us, learning who we are, and learning how who we are affects our life outcomes, affects our emotional states. So, bottom line, shifting away from performance goals and adopting mastery goals we get to reap a tremendous number of psychological benefits as a result of that choice, of that decision. Now, I did say something a little earlier, and I want to go back to this. How many of you, and I asked this question in our, in our little discussion, our Zoom discussion, how many of you believe you have a math gene? Right? I can do math well because I got a math gene. I don't do math well because I don't have the math gene. What these are is the conversation that you would observe in an entity theorist. They believe that our personal qualities are fixed somehow, and genetics is often the place to point the finger, right? But it could be in life opportunities as well. Entity theorists tend to believe that the person, personal qualities are fixed, right? And they tend to then subscribe to performance goals. Interestingly, for entity theorists, if someone's working really hard, ironically, that demonstrates low ability. They must be of low ability because they have to work so hard. If they were of high ability, they would just do it. They would just get it, 
right? And, and that's a tremendous irony when you think about it. Now, incremental theorists are people who say, we can learn this shit. Anybody can learn this, right? That we are changeable. We're not fixed. That we can, through effort, through stick to through grit, right? that we can improve. So we really enjoy mastery goals because mastery goals allow us to show improvement where performance goals show us kind of relative, uh, relative performance to others. So the meaning of effort to someone who's an incremental theorist is utility of effort. Challenging tasks require high effort. And it's not an indication of my low ability. It's actually an indication of my desire to master the task. Right? So, homework four, part four, super simple here. Just a little table so that we can get a handle on each other, right? Where do you fall in the entity, entity incremental philosophical continuum of personal qualities? So please put an X in the cell that indicates your philosophical position. So you're going to put your name here, and then you say, oh my God, life is totally determined, to it's total entity, right, or somewhat entity, a bit of entity, a bit instrumental, I, I mean, yeah, uh, incremental, all the way to totally incremental. All right? So just fill that out. Just reflects your philosophy in life. Note two. <laughs> The, in this scale, and I like to talk about scale design. I had a class in scale design. I've been with scales for a lot of years, right? In this, I gave you no center option. So even numbered scales, I'm pushing you one direction or the other. You're going to come out at least <laughs> a bit incremental or a bit entity, if not more so. No zero points, no cop outs. Oh, I think it's both or, or, or something like that. So sometimes we design scales with the intent of pushing per, a person to one side or the other, for better or for worse. Now, we need a super duper gear change here. We're going to talk about affiliation and intimacy. Remember we talked about that all the way back at the beginning of this lecture. Well, let's talk about these needs then of affiliation and intimacy. So what do we know about affiliation? How about a definition? It's establishing, maintaining, or restoring a positive, affective relationship with another person or persons. It's not extroversion, sociability, or friendliness. That's not affiliation, right? It's more fear of interpersonal rejection. And the fear of rejection is powerful. One of, one of the leaders in relationship theory that talked about the fear of rejection was Elaine Hatfield. And, and she had a lot to say about this. That love is characterized by high arousal and that love is characterized, romantic love, by fear of rejection. Right, so Hatfield's passionate love can have a substantial fear of rejection component. Now let's talk about the need behind relationships because relationships are how we can meet our affiliation need. It's hard to have affiliation needs met if we're not involved in relationships. Baumeister and Leary call this a basic human motive. Maybe even to the level of drive, but the need to affiliate. Now, but notice that we're going to vary on this and the part of the key of this lecture is individual differences. So yeah, affi uh, affiliation might be a basic human motive, but it's going to vary across people within our species. But ultimately, is it affiliation or is it a balance between affiliation and alone time? Right? So this optimal balance is something that we may negotiate, and we know that sometimes we feel a little over-affiliated and we might just want to spend some time alone. And note, individual differences dictate kind of what that ratio is. What do we get from affiliation? Well, we get energy. We get attention. We get stimulation. We get information. We might get emotional support. So there's a lot of benefits out there to affiliating successfully. We see that with a close, with a network of close social ties, we tend to be happier people who have this, healthier and more satisfied with life than those people who are more isolated. All else being equal, but again, allow for individual differences to modify this statement. Now, one question we might ask as human beings, are we successful at managing our affiliation needs? And
and I wanted to bring up this study. I love this study. This demonstrated that people are pretty good judges of when they want to be alone or when they want to be with others. That is, people are pretty good at assessing their current state and then changing that state to the desired state. This study was done with pagers, and, and this is an old device back in the days. This is typical 1990s. Uh, you know, when I worked at the paper mill, they, that was kind of the rite of passage. As I became salaried, they said, oh, you're salaried, and now you work in the quality control department. You're assistant quality control supervisor. You know, here you are, man, salaried. You've arrived. And they hand me this thing, and I say, what's that? And I say, it's a pager. And I said, well, what am I going to do with this? And it says, well, part of being salaried in this department is you get to be on call. And I said, does that mean what I think it means? And it says, yeah, every six weekends... You have to stay in town, and you have to be ready on a moment's notice to come to the mill from Friday at 5 p.m. to Monday at 8 a.m. You're on call, and if, if someone pages you, you got to hustle your ass down to the mill and take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. So that sucks. But pagers, man, pagers were the deal. And, and pagers are stupid. Because the pager, right, the pager goes off. It goes beep, 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 beep. That's why they also call them beepers. And, and, and you take it and you look at it and it displays a phone number. And that's the phone number of the person who paged you. So now you have to go find a telephone and you have to call them and say, hey, what's going on? What do you need? Cell phones didn't exist yet, at least not, <laughs> in, 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 not, not for a lot of people. You had to be super wealthy. Right? So it's kind of an interim step. Pretty silly. Now, for an experimental device, they'll think about this. What we do is... We give someone, a, a participant, a pager, and you say, okay, so wear this for a week. And they say, okay. And then we hand them a diary, and we say, here's a diary, and any time that pager goes off, and it's going to go off every hour or so during waking hours, you know, so about 16, 17 times a day, this thing's going to go off. When it goes off, okay, hit the button on it, and then open your diary and answer the two questions in the diary. The two questions were, are you with someone right now? And the second question is, do you want to be with someone right now? That's it. But notice, it's this kind of longitudinal time study over one week. And the participants, what are we able to figure out? Well, O'Connor and Rosenblood found out that people, two-thirds of the time, were in the state that they wished they were in at the last paging. So this paging says, do you want to be with someone? No, not really. I don't want to be with someone. Two-thirds of the time, when the pager went off the next time, someone was not with someone, they had achieved their desired state. The take-home point is, we're pretty damn good at managing our affiliation needs. Now, once we determine that, we say, well, what do people get out of affiliating? And, and there was a group of researchers who wanted to answer this question in terms of emotion. And, and Schachter demonstrated that when people are afraid, they have a greater desire to affiliate. So the emotion becomes a moderating variable that affects the desire to affiliate, right? But Sarnhoff and Zimbardo, and you know Zimbardo, right, demonstrated that when people are embarrassed, they'd rather not affiliate. And you're going like, oh, no, duh, right? But everyone's now running around trying to pick out these emotions and, 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 and the effect on affiliation. And Rolf comes along and he simplifies the formula. He says, we don't need to do this on the basis of every frickin' emotion that we can name. What we need to understand is that people understand they have naive theories about emotion and also the benefits to affiliation. So they have naive theories. And if I believe that affiliating will be a benefit, then I will affiliate. If I believe that affiliation will not be a benefit under these circumstances, then I won't. The expected utility of the interaction is a calculus that guides whether we choose to affiliate or not, or at least moderates that effect. Cool studies, right? Okay. Let's uh, move towards closing this out. We've talked an awful lot about affiliation. Let's shift the conversation slightly to intimacy. And it's a social motive to engage in warm, close, positive interpersonal relationships that carry little fear of rejection. So in relationships, new relationships, right, often we're not certain we may in fact be rejected, 
but that causes high levels of arousal that can be descriptive of passionate love. But over time, as we become more familiar with our partner, we develop a bond of trust, at least we hope we do, right? And this fosters intimacy, and that's diminishing perhaps the fear of rejection, right? So, affiliation and intimacy, what does it look like? Well, profile of high intimacy motivation, thoughts. So the category, if, if we have high intimacy motivation, then we have thoughts of friends and relationships. We think about these people to a great extent, our partner, our parents, our, our siblings, right? Story themes, relationships produce positive affect, reciprocal dialogue, expressions of, of relationship commitment, union, expressions of interpersonal harmony. My wife and her sister are really tight. And I mean, her sister gave her on Christmas, or it was a birthday, I don't remember which, this picture of two women, this, this figure of two women. It's not a picture, it's a little statue, right? The, the kind of growing out of each other. And, and it's an expression of intimacy. It's a story theme that she's communicating. We are tight as sisters, right? If we have a high intimacy motivation, we can engage freely in self-disclosure. We develop intense listening habits, right, and, and, and have many conversations. The autobiography that we have, themes of love and dialogue are mentioned as personally significant life experiences, so people talk about their partner to a great extent. Individual rated as warm, loving, could come out of pure ratings, and then memory will have enhanced recall. So if we have a high level of intimacy motivation, we can then observe uh, enhanced recall of stories involving themes of interpersonal interactions, right, for those who have a high intimacy motivation. Now, what are the conditions, and this is something that I get to throughout the course, right? Conditions that involve and satisfy the affiliation and intimacy needs, right? Well, interestingly, affiliation need, as we said, contains the fear of rejection, so it might be deficiency-oriented motive. That is, when I'm under-affiliated, I'm motivated to affiliate. So the motivation to affiliation can often be explained as the absence of affiliation, so I'm motivated to affiliate. Now, intimacy need is a growth-oriented motive, interpersonal caring, right? So the need-satisfying condition becomes relatedness with a warm, reciprocal, enduring relationship, right? Which means that I have to contribute equally to what I pull out. Notice affiliation needs can be more one way, the need-satisfying condition being social acceptance, approval, right, and reassurance. So in that needs satisfying condition for affiliation is it's largely a taking process. Tell me you love me. Tell me you want to be around me. How come you're not over here? But notice the, in the intimacy need, one has to contribute equally to what they get out of it. Hence, affiliation and intimacy motives and needs. Let us talk about power. Well, Joseph Stalin, great example of power and a high level of power power need, right? Uh, an amazing level of power need, if you will. How to make everyone happy? Ah, just kill all those uh, being unhappy, right? So, the need for power is a desire to make physical and social world conform to one's personal image or plan for it. And control is the big word, right? Impact allows power needing individual to establish power, having impact on others. Control allows power needing individuals to maintain power. So I want to have impact, and I want to be able to maintain it, and I want to be able to influence. That allows power needing individual to expand or restore power through the process of influence. Power and influence then prefer interpersonal tone that is influential rather than intimate, right? High power needs and leaders have demonstrated poor group-generated decisions. And this is the basis of groupthink, which is something that you probably discussed in your social psychology class. Other aspects of power? Well, conditions that involve and satisfy the need for power? Leadership. Aggressiveness, more so than assertiveness. Influential occupations, where one can demonstrate their power over others. Prestige positions, and here we have Vladimir Putin, right? He was a very powerful person, probably the most powerful person in the world, 
when you get right down to it. Some would argue, no, the President of the United States is the most powerful person in the world. But it appears that Putin had a tremendous amount of control over the President of the United States, right? Uh, to an excessive degree. Power and gold pursuit, what do we know? Uh, Putin has a watch collection, so he's always displaying these, you know, $10,000, $30,000, $50,000 or watches. Putin is a public servant and yet has managed to acquire maybe $40 billion in assets. Fascinating how that happens. Power and gold pursuit, power increases approach tendencies. People high in the need for power more easily acquire the goals they seek. No duh. Leadership motive patterns, high need for power, low need for affiliation, and a high level of self-control. Vladimir Putin is like a seventh degree judo black belt. The, the <laughs> This man is intense, right? He's scary intense, right? It's, it's just amazing to consider and think about. So, leadership motive pattern then, what do we know? Well, high need for power, low need for affiliation, high self-control is described, special variant in the leadership motive power. Hey, Penelope, how are you doing? Where have you been all day? It's not that time, is it? You're not looking for, you know, it can't be that time. All right. She's not looking for food yet. She just wants attention. A little affiliation needs. Mm -hmm. All right. So, unfortunately, what do we know about power? Power motivated individuals may demonstrate that the end justifies the means. All right. So, wh whatever needs to be done, hey, anything goes because I'm in power and I can make that shit happen. We often see people with high power motivations that engage in lying, right? And lying is one way to get what we want, right? The trust me type of authoritarianism. And when people say trust me, we should... <laughs> when someone says trust me, I think it's more beneficial than to up your level of distrust at that point. Because why is this person then requiring me to trust them? Why are they urging me to do this? Shouldn't the information just develop trust in and of itself? What do you think, sweetie? I know. People with power issues often have drinking problems and or drug problems, right? Uh, they often engage in risky behaviors, unnecessary risky behaviors, because it kind of is, they can demonstrate their power by nothing sticks to them as a result of committing these. They engage in gesturing and posturing. Uh, often, ah, this, this raised fist is, is one way. Uh, abusive language. They like to put each other down, uh, put, put other people down. They often engage in bullying, if you will. Uh, drug use along with drinking problems, I kind of lump those together. A drug is a drug is a drug, whether it's alcohol or whether it's Adderall, right? Uh, and aggression. Uh, these people might then engage in spousal abuse, bullying, and or road rage are all components of excessive power. So there's not a lot to be good to be said about the need for power. Uh, Let's just go with it there. And uh, in that discussion of power, now I need a, a little pick-me-up. How about you? Penelope, how do you feel about a little pick-me-up? So let's end it. Let's call it good. And uh, if this doesn't pick you up, I, I don't know what will. There's Zelda. Pretty Zelda, right? Zelda doesn't have much of a need for power but she certainly has high intimacy needs. So, you guys, this has been Lecture 7. Remember, we were talking about acquired needs. So these are needs that are the product of our socialization. Quasi-needs and social needs. If you have any questions, bring them on down. we got office hours and, and we got our Zoom sessions, right, to help you prepare for your homework assignments as needed. And I hope you have a great day. All right, Penelope? Let's say goodbye. Say goodbye. Bye. All right. Take care, guys.